So, um, let's get, pick up where we left off last time. We were talking about the uh, pre-Islamic Arabs and uh, who Arabs were. And uh, I said something to you about um, poetry being truer than history, or it's what people think happened, not what really did happen that matters. And I was trying to go over uh, who is an Arab, what, uh, you know, how Arab, because Islam will start with Arabs and then spread out to other peoples. Um, what, what is an Arab? When the word Arab first came into play in literature, I mentioned the book of Job, which is a biblical book. Um, how many have read the book of Job? Well, the book of Job is a really interesting book, very, very peculiar book. It's a late book. It's written in the form of a Greek dialogue. So it really shows uh, Hellenistic influence in the fact that it's written like a Greek dialogue, uh, like a Platonic dialogue or even a play. And uh, so it's not written like earlier books of the Bible. And so we, 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 we and the philosophy it expresses is uh, what we would call cynic, Greek cynic philosophy to some extent. Um, even book like Ecclesiastes has expresses a kind of cynic philosophy. Uh, all is vanity, vanity, vanity. One generation passes away and a new generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever and nothing really amounts to anything. They don't really have an, a doctrine at that point, and it's probably around the 5th century BC of resurrection of the dead. Because if they had that doctrine that was seriously being used or considered, they would have an answer for all these things, you see. That um, everything isn't vanity. If you're good in this world, you'll be resurrected in the next, and so therefore uh, everything was going to pay off for you. Uh, so those books show a, a point in the development of Hebrew culture, Jewish religious Hebrew culture, which um, this doctrine has not yet come into active play. Maybe some people had it, but most people didn't. That would be around the 5th century BC, so those books are probably around the 4th, 3rd, 5th, 4th, or 3rd century BC having been written. And Job is among them. Job, Job is asking the question, why do the good men suffer? Why do the righteous suffer? Why do little children suffer? Now, the wise guy later on has got all the answers to say, oh, well, they suffer in this world, so they'll have a better life in the next. But Job doesn't have that answer. He doesn't have the answer. For those of you who read Job, that answer is not given. Uh, he, he tries to give an answer, but the answer isn't clear. He's wrestling with the problem of uh, unjustified suffering of the righteous. And he doesn't really have an answer for it. But for our purposes, the interesting part of that book, again, the book, I think, shows it to be around 5th or 4th century B.C. Uh, the interesting part of that book, I see, uh, people think all these things are from God or the Word of God, as I was saying in my Old Testament class the other night. I mean, this is a you know, useful, cohesive doctrine to bring about communal solidarity and so on, but um, anyone who studies documents sooner or later finds out there's human there's human uh, activity involved in, in, in the doctrine. And whether God had anything to do with it or inspired it is uh, your own personal um, evaluation. But uh, you can study a document and see pretty much from the time and place in which it came. And, uh, you know, we normally think of God as being an eternal being of some kind. So one doesn't usually think of him as developing in time and place. <coughs> But anyway, take the, the the book of Job is peculiar in that. Did you notice those, those of you who read it? It is not does not take place in Palestine or Israel at all. It's not in Palestine and Israel. It's in what we would call the diaspora or the, the spreading out away from Palestine and Israel. Where does it take place? Actually, it takes place in northern Arabia. All the place names are northern Arabian place names that actually st are still exist to this to this very day. One of them is Taima. Uh, and it's an oasis in northern Arabia. Job travels to the oasis of Taima. It's a northern Arabian uh, uh, Jewish book, which shows the Jewish presence in northern Arabia in the 5th century B.C. Uh, 
so the Jewish presence uh, goes back quite quite a ways uh, in Arabia. Not that we, one wants to make a Zionist claim to Arabia particularly, but I'm trying to say that the Jewish presence is way back there. And Job is a good book to illustrate that because all the place names in Job are Northern Arabian place names. So whether Job is real or not, the writer knows Northern Arabian and knows the place names in Northern uh, Arabian. That would be the fifth or fourth or third century BC. So uh, I think that is uh, pretty interesting. Um, getting back to the Arabs. I was saying to you that once you got in the Quran, the idea that the Arab peoples are descendants of Abraham through his older son Ishmael, the daughter of the Egyptian bond servant Hagar, uh, the son of the uh, Egyptian bond servant Hagar, as opposed to the normative wife. Who was the normative wife? Sarah, according to the biblical presentation. And who was the child of Sarah? Isaac. Isaac. Now the Bible, Hebrew, Jewish, Christian, focuses on preferred lines. It's not just, I mean, no one's trying to say these are just books. These are books of their time, and they do uh, show the outlook of their period. I mean, in your family, let's face it, your family is interested in its line. It's not interested in your cousin's line. Your cousin's family can be interested in, in their line, but your family, you want to know who your dad was, or your grandfather was, or your great-grandfather was. That's just normal human nature. It's not being mean or anything like that. And uh, so the Jews out of that get a chosen people idea coming down that their line is a preferred line because God uh, put his blessing and choice on, uh, on them and so on and so forth. Uh, Today, if you were a Jewish background, you could say, yeah, Jews are preferred line. They're chosen for suffering, nothing else. <laughs> it's always dangerous to set yourself out there as a chosen line because then people are surely going to make you suffer. The same as Joseph did with his brothers. You know, Joseph went around uh, you know, acting like he was King Tut and his brothers uh, paid him back in kind. Uh, so uh, it doesn't often uh, pay to be the preferred or even the apple of your parents' eye because someone else might take offense and get you anyway because of that. In any event, you have to understand, whether you're a Muslim, Christian, Jew, or Buddhist, or some other, I know that Muslims prefer not to uh, acknowledge these things. First of all, they don't know them because, as I said, they only go far back as Muhammad. And their information comes through the presentation of Muhammad, which, as we've said several times now, is a miraculous presentation in their eyes, uh, presented to them through angelic um, um, auspices, particularly the angel Gabriel I mentioned uh, last time. So they feel, whether they're told to feel this or just a, just human being feels, oh, I don't have to do anything more than that. I got it all from the miraculous book here. But having said that, you, if you're a fair-minded person, and I'm talking about whatever your religion is, you look at it, you realize that that material is based on the genealogies in the Old Testament. That that material has come down through the genealogies in the Old Testament. And uh, like it or not, and it's not to say one is superior or inferior, the genealogies in the Old Testament are much more fleshed out than that. Like anybody, Muhammad as a human being, or the angel dictating to him, is only interested in Muhammad's particular line coming from those genealogies. He's not interested in the totality of the genealogies. But the totality is not to be found in the Quran. The totality, as far as what we know, can know about what was presented, good or bad, it may not be accurate even in the Old Testament. No one is saying the Old Testament is accurate necessarily. It's the folk memory of a people which can be accurate, can be inaccurate, fleshes out the entire genealogies of these, of these uh, groups. Now, for the Old Testament and for the Koran and for Christianity, Abraham is the important person. Now, like it or not, 
everyone is going along, going around claiming descent from Abraham. And uh, the question is, of course, did Abraham really exist? How do we know he existed? Where did Muhammad? Where did the angel? Whoever told Muhammad these things, the angel or some people, whatever, get the idea that Abraham was the important person? Well, obviously, the book that tells that Abraham is the important person is the Hebrew Bible. That's where, because it's the Jews per se, who claim descent from Abraham and all the others, Uh, how do we put it? Opt on to that. Tack on to that. They're likewise descended from Abraham, but the focus on and when I look at the, this is all to be found in case you're interested to read it in the original presentation, and the original presentation is in what book in the Hebrew Bible? Book of the Hebrew Bible. Holy Bible. The Holy Bible. Well, the Holy Bible is a later book, uh, oh, uh, comprising two books, New Testament and Old Testament. But the Hebrew Bible only, com only comprises the Old Testament. So what book of the uh, Hebrew Bible is uh, are these stories to be found in? Hebrews. No, 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 that's a New Testament book. That's nothing to do with the Old Testament. What, 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 what book are these stories of, as you see, we're starting from scratch here. <laughs> Huh? Genesis? Yeah, Genesis. Genesis. First book of the Hebrew Bible is Genesis. It turned out to be the first book of the Christian Bible, too. But um, first book of the Hebrew Bible is Genesis. That's where the stories about Abraham are told. All the stories are told in Abraham. Huh? No, I'm just singing a song. <laughs> hey, I'm going to have a tough time singing over you. <laughs> You're going to have to sing that song to yourself because I'm not even going to be able to think of it pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> you and I are going to be doing a duet. <laughs> Any case, um, so that's where Abraham becomes a heroic character in that first time in history that we, he appears and that we know him as an heroic character. And that would be written, the legends may go back, I think, to the, so I'm going to say it goes back to the 12th, 13th century BC. I mean, Abraham, if he functioned, functioned in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century BC, no one is sure, anywhere from the 24th to the 16th century BC, that's supposed picture is, but the stories may come down from there in oral form, but written form, uh, they probably weren't getting into writing until around the 8th century BC, there were probably a thousand years of oral history before that, before they started even getting written. So you can say the book of Genesis is put in its final form, of, according to most people, in, during the Babylonian captivity in the, <coughs> in the uh, 500 BC period. But the stories go back older than that. And I would say, because the prophets who are writing in the 8th and 7th century BC in the Hebrew Bible know the story of, of Abraham. So therefore, uh, the story is older than that in its earliest form. Whether that was its written form, you follow me, is, is, is something else again. So Abraham becomes a significant character, you know, in writing around 9th century BC in the Palestine area. Now, when you look at the Bible story carefully, there's some old bits in there. And one even looks like it's an old Stevie that the writer has seen. You know, we have archaeological data that, you know, appears in our own time. We dig something up. We dig something up and we, uh, you know, and then we get information from it. They could do that in their time, too, but this is more ancient than they are. And there's one looks like an inscription, an inscription on a stele. What is a stele? Yeah, a stone pillar of some kind in which someone wrote some commemorative material on to commemorate either a famous act, a military victory, some claim for uh, triumph or important, uh, like um, maybe, for instance, um, if you go down to Virginia, you'll see, I think, a stone in the Chancellorsville, and it'll have a big, you know, there'll be a big description of the Battle of Chancellorsville on it or something like that. That'd be a modern student. I hear that in the uh, field in Pennsylvania where that airliner crashed. I read in the paper this morning they're going to erect a huge memorial and there'll sure be 
an inscription there commemorating what occurred at that particular place. So uh, we even have modern steelies, but the ancients had steelies. And this sounds like some take, something taken off a steely. It said, Abraham, Abraham the Hebrew, it was called Abram, not Abraham at that time in the biblical narrative. He later changed his name to Abraham when God gives him some some uh, favor. Uh, and that's all in the biblical story of Genesis. You have to read that yourself. I can't do that for you if you're interested. And I think you should read it because it's a, it's a, um, you know, when you're looking at data, it's a control data. So, in any case, uh, Abraham the Hebrew did such and such, fought some kings in this area, uh, rescued his cousin Lot, and chased and named several weird, weird sounding kings, so it sounds authentic, them as far as here, there, and everywhere else, and recovered the captives or something like that. And that's the first, I think, real mention of Abraham the Hebrew. And I think that's about all the Hebrews knew about Abraham the Hebrew. And all the other stories they then later, not invented, but developed out of that steely and maybe oral material. So I don't know how much of the Abraham material is authentic or not authentic, or how much is, uh, owed to storytellers. But as the material of Abraham develops in the book of Genesis, and we do that in Old Testament class, then we get his genealogical uh, aspects that the Hebrew uh, chronicler is very interested in, particularly the what we call the priest writer. And uh, we get several different genealogies coming down from him, but primarily we get the stories of his marrying Sarah supposedly when she's 90 years old or 99 years old. And the story is that Sarah laughs when the angel comes and tells her that she's going to have a child. She says, ha, I, at this time, <laughs> when I've already passed childbearing, I'm going to have a child. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, and then the angel said, why did you laugh? And then Sarah says, I did not laugh, blah, 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 blah. And the angel <laughs> says, yeah, you did laugh. Well, it turns out that the child, this is all a play on the child's name. Because the child is called Yitzhak. He laughs. And it's all a story about laughing to basically the storytellers explaining uh, Isaac, as you call him, or Itzhak, or what Itzhak, uh, in Arabic I think it's Ishak, uh, what Ishak, Isaac, Ishak's name is, and why it means laughter. Then there's another story about how uh, Isaac is playing, and uh, because Sarah earlier couldn't bear uh, Abraham, like all men, are presented in the Bible as just sex maniacs who can't control their sexual urges. And they'll, so-called, as the Bible puts it, going unto any woman who's hanging around that's presented to them. Uh, they, that's the language they use. He went in unto her. And uh, we're supposed to understand what that all means. Uh, but you, you do have an idea, seeing you've got porn videos all over the TV nowadays, what that means. Uh, so I don't have to elucidate that anymore. But uh, <laughs> the Bible's not half as pornographic as modern TV, but it's a bit pornographic in places. In any event, they're not very shy about sexual relations in those days. And uh, Abraham has a handmaiden called Hagar from uh, Egypt. She's uh, Sarah's servant, as she's presented. And because Sarah isn't bearing anybody, uh, Sarah gives him her handmaiden to play with. And uh, she bears a child, and that child is called Ishmael. And in Hebrew, that is Yishmael, God hears. God hears. Because God heard her prayer for a child. Uh, well, not her child, but the, the child of the handmaid. So all these names are always interpreted in the, in the Bible. Now, as Islam uh, develops, this child becomes called Ismail in Arabic. And um, the Hebrew genealogists then develop the later genealogies of Jacob, uh, Isaac through Jacob. And Jacob has a brother called Esau, and the race of Jacob and Esau. And then it uses all these patriarchs, as it were, to develop the genealogies of peoples. All these, uh, all these uh, Patriarchs become the head of peoples. So Esau becomes the head of what people? The Edomite people. Uh, Edom in Hebrew means red. The Red Sea is called red because these are the people around the Red Sea. You know, these are the Edomites, the red people. 
Um, I think the Red Sea, by the way, is called red. I've been on it because the mountains along it are all reddish color, and when they're reflected in the sea, it looks red. And I think that's the reason the Red Sea is called red. But anyway, the people who inhabited the Red Mountains, and how many, have you ever been in a de desert area and looked in the distance and the mountains all look red? You've seen, yeah, well, I mean, the people living in the Red Mountains, well, they'll be the red people. They're the Edomites. Anyway, they're the descendants of Jacob's brother Esau, according to the Bible. Now, Ishmael, Isaac's brother, or half-brother, as it were, Esau is a twin brother, Isaac is a half-brother. See, these genealogies are much more detailed than the Koran has, much more detailed, which I think shows you that the Koran has drawn from these genealogies either in an oral sense or another transmission sense. If you say the angel has done it, that's fair enough, that's your decision to describe it however you may, but the detail, the genealogies are much more extensive, and they're drawn that Muhammad, uh, the angel, the Quran, the Muslims pick and choose what suits them from these genealogies. I'm getting to a point here that Ishmael is going to be, before the Quran, the father of the Arab people. But that is not yet presented in the biblical narrative, which is 10 centuries earlier, at least, maybe 15. So, but Ishmael is introduced there, and do you remember the story about Ishmael playing with um, Sarah's child, and what happens there? Anyone remember that story? Oh, well, like typical things, uh, Hagar gets uppity, because okay. like any young woman who knows a man prefers her to some old hag who he's not preferring, she thinks she's the hotsy toxy one, you follow me? So she goes around putting on airs, and that gets Sarah angry, because she thinks Abraham prefers Sarah to uh, Hagar to her. <coughs> and then when she sees the children playing, she sees uh, Sarah does ultimately have a child in that miraculous way where the angel comes and tells her she's going to have a child when she's 99. So now she's got a child who's uh, somewhat younger than Ishmael called Isaac. And she doesn't like the fact that Ishmael is playing with Isaac. This is all very human. See, these storytellers were really very clever. They made stories that really appealed to people that people never forget, including, I think, the prophet never forgotten. He heard them as well whether, again, you heard it from an angel or at campfires from people who knew the stories orally or in writing from biblical backgrounds, uh, you'll have to decide that. But in any case, I'm sure for the Muslims in the room, they never heard these stories about uh, Ishmael and Isaac uh, and the whole relationship of Hagar and Sarah. They, they, I'm sure they've never heard these stories because no one ever tells it to them because they don't read the other literature. But we read it all. We read the Quran. We read the we read the Christian literature, we read the Jewish literature, so we can tell you. I'll get to a point about the Christians in a moment. So, Hagar, Sarah's jealous. Even in the Hebrew Bible, the heroes are not pre presented as perfect people. They have their foibles. Abraham is a real dumb jerk in many of the things he does, and I don't want to, I don't want to go into all that, but you, uh, you can read it yourself. I had a, a good friend of mine who was from Saudi Arabia uh, many years ago in my classes, and he took those classes and he said, they're lies, these are lies, these are lies, Abraham was not stupid like that, he couldn't have been stupid like that, these stories are full of lies about Abraham. Like, yeah, because in the Quran it says that the Jews and Christians lie in their stories, and uh, that's fair enough, I understand his reaction, maybe they are lies, but the poets were always big liars back in the old days of Greece, Rome, and every other place, and the poets wrote these stories to interest people. They made them human, and the patriarchs are not perfect. They're not little Jesuses walking around. They're not perfect people. Abraham has his failings. He needs uh, little girls when he's older to warm his bed. You know, he gets a third wife later on called Keturah, who uh, keeps him warm for his bones are getting a little brittle, and he's, you know, he needs a little uh, warming up when he's older. And so the storytellers make these things pretty, pretty human, including the jealousy of two wives. One, the official wife, and the other, the concubine. Obviously, there are going to be problems there, and the, the stories are fair enough about that. And the thing is that Sarah puts on air, she doesn't want her child playing with a concubine's child. So she goes to Abraham, and Abraham, weak as he's always presented in these stories, oh my God, uh, she says, get rid of this concubine to him. Now, my wife's told me the same thing many times, you know. Uh, <laughs> her imagination anyway, I mean, maybe I've um, got concubines running around and I'm never worried, God never granted me any that I'm aware of, but uh, in 
any case, get rid of the concubine, I think, is a, is a theme that goes through all of men and women's experiences. Any case, uh, Abraham doesn't want to do it, but he finally calls Hagar and Ishmael to him, and he banishes them and says, you must leave, you know, my wife can't, doesn't want you around anymore. And they do leave, and later on, the Bible's very sympathetic to Ishmael. Uh, has him sitting at a well, and they're starving in the desert, and then God, an angel appears, or God, or someone appears, God, and says that this is going to be your place, and here is a well, and you will have sustenance here and they named the well um, it's all in the biblical story and then it says and your son will be a father of peoples and that's where the Muslims or uh, Muhammad or the Quran and the others get the idea that Abraham is the uh, that Ishmael is the father of peoples the Arab peoples and it lists the tribes the, 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 the Bible is really um, interested in listing tribes and it lists the descendants of Ishmael and just like in the Jewish tribes, am I boring you? Um, those it gives you more information about Ishmael. Uh, just as in the Jewish tribes, who's the father of the Jewish nation besides Abraham? Isaac right. comes along. Yeah, but Isaac has two children, and they are they're at odds with each other, and one of them becomes another people, Esau, as I told you, and basically that's an Arab people too. Esau's Edomite people are Arabs. What we call Arabs. And later on, by the way, Ishmael's descendants do marry some of um, Esau's descendants in the biblical genealogies if you look at them closely. Uh, but th the real big guy is Jacob, third down on the genealogy. What happens to him? He gets involved with God too, and he changes his name, doesn't he? What new, new name does God give him after he gives, chooses him as his preferred person in the storyline? What, what new name does he give him? Hmm? Israel. Jacob is renamed Israel. That's where <laughs> all the trouble in the Middle East, in case you're interested, where does it all come from? It's biblical Jacob being renamed Israel. And therefore you get the 12. How many children does Jacob then have in the Bible form? Four different wives. And you get all those stories. How many have read those great sexy stories about uh, putting handmaidens in the bed because the one woman leaves off and then the other sister isn't getting enough children, so she puts her handmaiden in the bed, and then, uh, and you know, they, because the 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 children of the handmaidens are considered to be the children of the sisters. Yeah, what do you want to say? I was wondering, is the one of his handmaid or wife is Rachel or something? That's his, that's not his handmaid. That's his wife. That's oh, the okay. wife he loves. Uh, Leah and Rachel are the two one older sister, younger sister, and. He really wants Rachel if you want to get the whole story. And if you, if you want, you just read Genesis and then you'll get it. But it's all in there. He really loves Rachel because she's pretty. He likes the younger, but the dad says you can't have the younger before the older. And the dad slips in Leah, who's uglier, into his bed when the marriage night comes. And, hey, and Jacob comes and says, what did you do? You cheated me. I was supposed to get Rachel and you gave me Leah. He said, you got to work seven more years for Rachel. You got to work seven years for Leah and then seven more for Rachel. So he says, "Okay, I'll take them both." But then we have all the problem of they're competing, competing with each other. Yeah, this is the Bible. It's pretty, 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 uh, pretty launch, not launchy. Pretty. Uh, how do we put it? Pretty down to pretty earthy, pretty earthy. And I, I think that's attractive. These people are not perfect, what I'm saying. So then they compete with each other and they have trouble bearing. So then Rachel slips in her. Hand. There's always trouble bearing. Rachel can't bear. Finally, she bears Joseph in the end, Benjamin and Joseph, the two preferred uh, children of Jacob. But she has trouble just like Sarah does. So that's part of the biblical scheme. But in the meantime, they're all competing like mad to get these children out. And uh, the handmaidens are Bilcha and someone else. I forget the other one. But how many children then finally become the children of Jacob in the story from the four bear bearers? Two official wives and two handmaidens. Twelve. And what do we call those when it changes the name to Israel? The twelve tribes of Israel. So that's the genealogy of the twelve tribes of Israel. All the children from that marriage as it's presented. I'm not saying this is history. Don't any of you think that I'm, you know, I'm trying to be fair here. I'm just telling you the story. I'm not making any claims that this is divine, that this is an angel said it, that this is true, or this is colorful storytelling to explain genealogical origins. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, 
catechism or official dogma about this, that this is you know, pure truth or something like that. It's an attempt by the ancient people to portray in a colorful way for the entertainment of their people of their time, not necessarily ours, how we got where we are. And it may have mythology, it may have, uh, you know, tall tales, it may have uh, accurate history in there. That's something for you to decide. In any event, Ishmael also has 12 sons. And he has 12 tribes given to him according to the genealogists. They don't go into what happened to all these tribes. And Esau, he has 12 sons. Well, hey, 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 we got a problem here. Everyone's getting 12 sons. Yeah, why, why, why? Well, if you look into Greek culture, you'll find that they have a what's called a 12 tribe confederacy in the Greek mainland back in the ancient times. And one of the reasons they had a 12 tribe confederacy was for tax purposes. So each tribe could pay one month of taxes in the 12 month scheme of the year. So I think there's a lot of that involved in these 12 tribe uh, storytelling that go back. But okay, forget Ishmael, forget Esau, I mean forget Esau, forget Jacob. Let's go to the Arab hero, Ishmael. Ishmael, we can tell from his children that he's mainly centered in the Sinai Peninsula. Just as Jacob is mainly centered in the uh, Transjordan area, southern Transjordan going down the Red Sea. Ishmael is mainly, according to the Hebrew genealogists, and that's 15 centuries before the Koran, uh, mainly centered in Sinai because, you know, he has some tribes that we know are Sinai. Midian, for instance, is one of them. Later on, by the way, Moses gets involved with a priest of Midian, as you may recall, and marries one of the priests of Midian's daughter. So he does marry an Ishmaelite, <coughs> as it turns out. But uh, in the Joseph stories in the Bible, there are Ishmaelite merchants and there are Midianite merchants, and basically they're interchangeable. And Midian is, is Sinai, is Sinai. So, I mean, these things are pretty, you can, you can pretty much go. Now, according to the way the Koran gets a hold of this material, many, 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 many centuries later, as Muhammad, through the angel, presents it, we are the descendants of Ishmael. Ishmael is our father. Therefore, our uh, relationship to Abraham is as good as any other people's. And we are actually somewhat better because Ishmael is the older son and uh, Isaac is the younger son, so actually we have a prior claim to some extent, and um, we have as much claim as anyone else to the heritage of Abraham. And as the Quran expresses this, the religion of Abraham. And as Muhammad will, or the Quran will, and we'll read this, go on to discuss it, the Jews and Christians have corrupted the heritage and tradition of Abraham through various lies and other things and what we're doing in the Quran is restoring the primitive purity of the original monotheism of Abraham. We, the descendants of Ishmael, are, um, are um, restoring the original purity of the religion of Abraham. And the name of that religion is Islam. Abraham's original religion is Islam. And we have restored it to its original purity, which the Jews and Christians, in their turn, corrupted. And this is basically the theological argument that we'll get in the Koran. I, 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 will, I will read it to you. Um, and out of this came the idea that all Arabs are descendants of Ishmael, which gets back to where I started last time. You see how complicated it is. You see, I, I, as I told you, I think if you take genealogical uh, DNA tests, you probably are going to find much different results than that. I think you'll find some Greek blood running around. I think you'll find a lot of Egyptian blood running around. I think you'll find a lot of African blood running around. I think you'll find a lot of Berber blood running around. But you see, the myth takes over. The myth takes over the reality. Because the reality is much too complex for people. You, you follow what I'm trying to say? Much too complex for Now that we have the tools, we can actually explore the reality. I love DNA testing. I like to see you what the Jews from Poland come out to be, or things like that, you know. I mean, it, this is great DNA testing. I mean, we, 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 we can get tremendous, I mean, they're doing a lot of testing in Africa and different places. It's all very interesting kind of claims that are either being validated or punctured through, 
through uh, DNA testing, not that I'm into racial testing, things like that, but it's just interesting for scientific purposes to find out where people really did come from. I mean, where did the Bushmen in Australia come from? We do the DNA testing and probably find out they come from southern India. Uh, you know, and stuff like that. But, um, you know, uh, uh, it's really, really fascinating, really fascinating to do the, the DNA testing. But in any case, I think they were doing some DNA testing down in um, uh, Oklahoma recently. Uh, just, yeah, a couple of weeks back there where this woman was saying that she was a Cherokee. And, and, you know, if you're a Cherokee, you're involved in the Cherokee Nation and you're entitled to certain privileges and so on. And she wanted them to put her on the Cherokee Rolls. And they said, no, we're not going to put you on the Cherokee Rolls because from what you're saying, you're only 116th Cherokee. And in fact, you know, you've got to be more than 116th Cherokee. I mean, actually, she was mostly Afro-American. And, uh, but she claimed she was 116 Cherokee. They had a huge argument. They went did the, uh, the uh, DNA uh, thing, and actually the DNA did come out that she was about 116th Cherokee and the rest Afro-American. And I don't know if they put her on the rolls or they didn't, but the point was the DNA validated what she was saying, whether they were going to then entertain it or not in the Cherokee. And why she wanted to be a Cherokee anyway, I don't know. But maybe there were some special benefits that you could get from being a Cherokee. I, I, I don't know the whole, whole thing. But this is going on quite a bit. So don't forget, the Arabs conquered a lot of people. And as the people came in, they adopted the mythology of the Arabs. And though they may have been the opponents of the Arabs, they may have even been people whose parents were slaughtered by Arabs and so on. And I'm not saying the Arabs slaughtered by people, I'm just saying that in warfare this can happen. And your ancestors may actually have been the enemies who may have been killed. You may have been even a slave taken and your, and your ancestors killed. And then you adopted it and then you, you totally changed to be the other person. This can certainly happen and I was saying that before. So I think this claim of, oh, we're all cousins, the Jews and the Arabs are cousins, and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, to some extent, but I'm sure not in the vast way it's made across the whole Islamic world. It's very nice that everyone wants to be kissing cousins, but if you really want to get down to the true genealogies and care about what really is the fact, I think you'll find a much more checkered picture. And the idea that we're all the sons of Ishmael, I, I frankly don't even know if Muhammad is the son of Ishmael, the direct son of Ishmael. Of Ishmael. He thinks he is, or the angel thinks he is. But don't forget, Muhammad comes from down in Mecca, and uh, that is not the normal area where the Ishmaelites are pictured as having uh, hung out in the, uh, in the 15th century BC. Now, maybe they moved down to Mecca, but I'm sure there were other tribes down in Mecca who were not Ishmaelite uh, tribes. And uh, so uh, the genealogies are there in the song and story, and we'll get them in here of uh, what the Quraysh tribe is, the tribe, uh, the tribe uh, that Muhammad comes from, and the Quraysh tribe then will trace its roots back to Ishmael and so on, because uh, in the desert, genealogies are everything. <coughs> Why are genealogies everything? Because there are no villages as such. Everything is in flux, it's like being at sea. And the only thing that provides you protection is your genealogy. Your blood connection, as these stories will show, to someone else. Because in that uh, Cain story that you may or may not remember in the early parts of the Bible, Cain, if you remember, slays his brother Esau. And then um, uh, God is angry at him, according to the story. It's the second or third story in the Bible after the Adam and Eve story, before the Abraham stories. And uh, then Cain says to God, you know, God says, you are an outcast. Uh, I'm banishing you. Well, there's supposed to be no one else there. I don't know who he's banishing him from, but it, there are lots of people around, as it turns out. Cain and Abel are supposed to be the second and third people on the earth, but in fact, there are lots of people running around. And the storyteller in the Bible is not worried about such fine points. But in any case, God says, hey, Cain says, protests to God. He says, anyone who comes upon me can kill me. And that's the thing of the outcast. If you don't have a tribal affiliation, you are dead meat. If I walk even into South LA or some areas that are dominated by gangs, which may have been some of the problem in New Orleans, someone said, you walk into some of those areas, you're dead meat if you don't have a, an affiliation. And there's no one going to protect you. No one going to protect you. So you just can't go into certain areas without protection. And the protection is either the gang or the blood relationship. 
which is the gang usually is based on a blood relationship, actually. You know, extended family, connections of cousins and others, and neighborhood connections, of course. So, I mean, this even comes up to modern maelstroms of inner cities. And it works in the desert, too. So the blood thing is, so God says, okay, okay, Cain, I'm sorry for you. Ooh, what does God do for Cain to help him out? Huh? Puts the mark of Cain on him. He marks him. He says, okay. And it seems like an old poem, an uh, old ditty. He says, something, I take vengeance, blah, blah, blah. Vengeance is the key to stopping people from murdering other people. Seven times vengeance will be taken for Cain. And I'll take it. The Lord, the God, says, I'll take vengeance for Cain. If anyone touches Cain, seven times vengeance will be taken. And that's enough. Oh, so Cain goes away after you. So, okay, he's got someone to protect him. But in the, in the desert, the blood relationship was your protection. And the worst thing that could happen to you would be to be banished from the tribe. Because you no longer enjoy the tribe of, of tribal protection. And, you were banished from the tribe very often for murder or things like that. And so the Cain story actually reflects real tribal Bedouin sort of situations as they existed way back in time. Uh, and if you did a criminal activity within the tribe, you could be banished, then anyone could kill you because you had no, no protection. Your only protection was the tribe. Uh, and what, was the, what would the tribe do? Take vengeance for you. It couldn't stop you from being killed by someone who hated you, but it could, uh, it could discourage that person from doing it by saying, if you kill that person, we're going to kill your relatives, or we're going to kill you. And that's a pretty good, um, that's a pretty good deterrent, as we know from the situations we study in the modern world. Okay, so I'm off the subject there again. Oh, we've done the Ishmael claim. We know where that came from. We know what it means. We know how far it extends. And you can decide if it extends all the way out to Algeria and all the way down to uh, Yemen and uh, Oman and all the way east to Baghdad and every other place. That's up to you to decide. I don't think that's valid. I think that's where poetry comes into play. And that I told you originally, poetry is truer than history. So the poetry is what people really remember. The history is too complicated. So when the storyteller comes along, he reduces the story to one nice little package for you. And then that's the package that's remembered by your descendants forever after. Think of it. And I know I'm off the subject. I love this subject, so I'll, I'll just continue it a little more. Think of it. How much do you know about your great-grandfather? What? Great-grandfather? I don't even think I know his name. I don't know who he was married. I don't know who his brothers and sisters were. I don't know what he did in his life. I don't have any idea. I don't even know what my grandfather did in his life, hardly. I don't know if he had fun. Did he enjoy himself? Did my grandfather enjoy himself? I mean, was his wife happy? Uh, did she have family problems? When you think of it, your knowledge scan is so limited. It's incredibly, it's incredibly limited. You know more about the stories of Muhammad's life than you know about your own family. Or Abraham's life. You see how much the storyteller takes over your mind? You see, you resign your own family in favor of these important families. I know all about Jacob and his relation with his brothers. Do I know anything about my grandfather's relation with his brothers? No, I don't know a thing. Because the extent of human memory only goes that far. And it doesn't go much further. Now we have computers, we have Google, we have, you know, electronic databases. It, it, it'll go further now. It, it, you can keep records more easily, and you can check back in archives, but it's still very, very difficult. It's still the poetry is what reigns. It's the stories about Abraham Lincoln. It's the stories about uh, Muhammad. It's the stories about Abraham. Stories, those are the things that dominate your mind. You know more about those people, you know all about Abraham Lincoln's life, and you don't know anything about your own grandfather's life. And I'm in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. Make some of you want. Okay, last thing about Abraham. Christians like Abraham too. So we already have that the Muslims like Abraham, and they say they're going back to the religion of Abraham. We know the Jews claim they're descended from Abraham, and so on. But the Christians like Abraham too. Uh, for those of you who are Christian, do you know who very big on Abraham? Paul. Yeah, Paul. He's really big on Abraham. And 
Most Christians I know just go to church. Most Jews I know don't even go to synagogue. But some Christians go to church more than Jews I know go to synagogues. I think Muslims go to mosques more than Christians go to church, or I know more than Jews go to synagogues. Okay. What about most Christians I know, they've heard of Paul, but have they ever read anything by Paul? No, they only read about Jesus mostly, and they know a little bit about Paul, but never really actually read his, his letters carefully. Yeah, what are you going to say? Are you going to hit me on the head for something? I'm sorry, is no, Paul right. Saul? <laughs> but what's that got to do with what we're talking about? Oh, I'm just asking. Well, you, like yeah, that. I know, but you, you, you do the, you, you, know, my, you know, I'm a really uh, weird professor. I try to get a train of consciousness going, and you got your train of consciousness going, but if, if your train of consciousness gets imposed on my train of consciousness, what happens is the thought of my brain gets exploded and I'm gone, and I'm back in your thing. So I know you got this running around in your head, but sometimes maybe just keep it inside because, you know, the flow of what I'm doing is actually very um, difficult to, uh, to keep it going well, and once it goes, like it just went, the bubble gets burst, and then the whole class can suffer from that. So, yeah, Paul saw, but so what? That's not either here nor there. It's not, it isn't relevant to what we're talking about. So, it's a good question for you to ask me after the class, and I'm happy to ask. I don't want to make you feel constrained anyway. But just if I'm off on a thing, let me go because otherwise I'm dead. Anyway, let's go back to uh, Paul. So, most Christians I know don't read the letters of Paul to any extent, but in the letters of Paul. Abraham plays a big role. What two letters of Paul um, did Abraham play a really big role in? Romans and Galatians. How many have read Romans and Galatians? Okay. Romans and Galatians. Just read those letters. They're, they're both, mostly, mostly about Abraham. So not just Muhammad, but Paul before him is claiming that Christianity is the religion of Abraham. He says, he doesn't say religion, he uses a different word, but it's the same thing. He says, our faith is the faith of Abraham. That's what we are. And we knew Christians, we're better than Jews. You know, Jews are stubborn, uh, and all most anti-Semitism, by the way, even in the Quran, comes from Paul. That I can tell you right now. And it comes from Paul's arguments with the Jews, not outside Christianity, but the Jews inside of Christianity. Paul is arguing with the Jews who were the original Christians because he wants to institute a new ideological position that reduces their position and increases the position of the overseas communities that he's bringing in. And so he gets in these arguments, as scholarly academic arguments can get, very nasty. So finally, he starts going on. He even says at one point in Galatians, now you already know this isn't true from what we just said. The Jews are the sons of Hagar. <laughs> the Jews are the sons of Hagar. Now, for a dope who's never read the Bible, they'll accept that. You know, they'll accept that. that oh, well, Paul says that it must be true. But you see, Paul is playing rhetorical, polemical games. And what he wants to say is that Hagar is the slave woman. Hagar is the concubine. She is not the free wife. We are the children of Sarah because we are free. We new Christians, Paul's communities, are free. You see, it's all allegoricalizing that he's doing there in his political argument. And what he's doing is reversing the genealogies completely. He knows that the Jews are not the children of Hagar. In fact, the Arabs are claimed to be the children of Hagar. He knows that. But he's playing with, this is in Galatians chapter 4, chapter 3 and 4. And he says the Jews are the children of Agar, and Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. He knows that Hagar is someone who comes from Midian and Sinai, and he knows that the covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was made on Mount Sinai, and by all that he's saying the Jews are the slaves of the Mosaic covenant. The Jews are the slaves of the law is what he said. And, that, and therefore, he says at the end of that, cast out the bondservant. Cast out the law. Because Paul doesn't want people to observe Mosaic law. He only wants uh, people to observe faith in Christ. So all these very complex arguments. So he says, our religion 
in other places in Abraham and elsewhere is the faith of Abraham. Our religion is the faith of Abraham, and Abraham was not saved by the law. Because the law, the, he's using um, sophistical Greek logical arguments on, the, uh, on what are basically homegrown storytelling uh, genealogies. So, and it's just not the same. It's like a person going into a, an academic classroom in um, philosophy and applying the, uh, the methods of uh, philosophy to a story about um, American Indian genealogy. But that's what he's doing. So he said, you know, we, our faith is, um, our faith, faith in Jesus Christ, that's what saves, not the law. The Jews are slaves to the law, therefore they are the children of, of Ahagar. We are free of the law, therefore we're the children of the free woman. The free wo woman is Sarah. We are really the children of the promise. Christians are the true children of Abraham. And that's his whole argument in Abraham, in, 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 uh, in Romans and Galatians. Now, I bet there's hardly a Christian in the room that knows that. But in fact, that is the basic theological underpinning of Christianity. The Christianity we know. <laughs> is that the religion of Jesus? No, I don't think so. I don't think Jesus made any such arguments. But it's the religion of Paul, and Paul most people consider to be the real creator of Christianity as we know it. And I think that is certainly true. Why am I saying it? Because Muhammad makes the very same arguments in the Quran, just slightly different. He doesn't say that the, uh, that, uh, the Jews are the children of uh, Hagar and they're the slave people because they're enslaved to the law, and we're the free people, therefore we're the children of the free wife, and we're the children of Sarah. He says we actually are the children of Abraham, not of Sarah through Hagar, and we actually are literally descended, and we came before the others. The others came after us, the Torah of Moses and the religion of Jesus. These are full of lies, and they came later, and we're going back to Abraham's original monotheism. But the argument, you see, of priority of the religion of Abraham, or as Paul calls it, the faith of Abraham, is the same argument. Two world religions are created on the basis of the same argument. Christianity, in the presence of Paul. Islam, in the presence of the way the Quran presents what Abraham's religion was. Both are arguing for Abraham's religion. Now, the last point before I get into the things that I want to move on to. When Paul is writing this stuff, he's really interested in northern Syria. He's writing a lot of stuff to northern Syria. That's where Christianity originally took hold, in places like Antioch, Edessa, and other places in northern Syria, for you Muslims in the room in Roman times. And he's writing his letters there, and you see, in the Bible stories, Abraham came from northern Syria. Abraham's family originally came from southern Iraq, then they moved up to northern Syria, then they came down into Palestine, and then they settled in the areas, what we call the West Bank today. Uh, Nablus, Jerusalem, Hebron, and those places. That, that's where they settled according to the biblical story. But they originally started from Haran in northern Syria. And Haran is where Abraham started. In fact, Haran, it takes the name of one of Abraham's brothers or uncles. That's where that name comes from. So, Paul is writing letters to an area where Abraham's name was already um, looked upon with a certain amount of respect and awe. Therefore, he uses Abraham as the person he wants to focus attention on and what his faith was. And he takes a passage from the book of Genesis where God spoke to Abraham and, and counted, it says, and God counted his faith as righteousness. Or God counted his faith as justifying him or making him righteous. And that's, that's where Paul runs with. Genesis 15, 6, and he says, okay, that's us. That's the Christians. Our faith justifies us. Our faith makes us righteous. And you know what our faith is? Faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what saved us. And that's what you'll find in front of all churches everywhere. But it's really an argument uh, uh, aimed at northern Syrian places where Abraham was an important personage. Now, there's another letter in the New Testament called the letter of James. And the letter of James says, oh, you foolish man. Obviously arguing with a person like Paul which is why we know there were divisions in the early church about these things. Also focusing on Abraham, saying, 
It's in the letter of James in the New Testament. Don't you know that Abraham was also justified by works because he was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac and for that reason he was called a friend of God and that's how we're saved not by faith but by faith and works working together how many are familiar with that particular argument in the, in, the, in the New Testament well good we're learning a little bit about religion here I tell you that is in the, in the letter of James that's an attack on the Pauline position it's rare that it would get in the New Testament that's why I write books about James because I'm trying to rescue him from the oblivion in which the official doctrines threw him and show that James is related in some way to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is another expertise of mine which I work on. And that's why I'm known, and that's why I went to Italy, and that's why people uh, know about the work I do, because it's pretty unique in that regard. And so it's interesting to a lot of people. But going over to Islam, you'll find, and I'll show you, where Muhammad over and over again says, and you're saved by faith and works together. And you'll see that Muhammad is right on the Jamesian line that he's he, he, he talking about faith and works and I, I can't give it to you but it's in we'll see it in the surah of the cow the, the the second surah basically the first surah of the Quran because the first surah is a blessing and the second surah is called the surah of the cow and you'll see that he says that about two or three times uh, faith and works working together more or less and um, uh, he, he um, I think he uh, picks up a lot of the Jamesian positions in the Quran uh, that are in this argument uh, in northern Syria over over how you're saved, faith and works, or just by by faith. But uh, Muhammad also picks up the sacrifice of Abraham's son as a very important episode. He picks that up in the Quran too. Now in the Bible and in James and in other parts of the New Testament, it's the sacrifice of Isaac. But for the Muslims, it becomes the sacrifice of Ishmael. That Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Ishmael. And this way he was seen as faithful to God and fulfilling God's word. And therefore that's another big point in the Quran which he picks up that you find in the letter of uh, James and the final thing that you find in all of uh, Islamic uh, ideology and discussion and so on is what you get in the letter of James too that Abraham is the friend of God it's in uh, the letter of James it's in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls Abraham is the friend of God and he was called friend for his faithfulness and in the Quran Abraham is called the friend any Muslim in the room will tell you that that is true. And what's he called in Arabic? Al-Khalil, the friend, the friend. And so that ideology has come all the way down into the Quran and in, into Islam. It's not in Paul, it's in James and the Dead Sea Scrolls that Abraham is the friend of uh, God. And then the city named after Abraham in Hebrew is Hebron. Hebron is based on the Hebrew root for Haver. Haver in Hebrew means friend. So the city of Hebron is called the city of friend. And in Islam, they move that over. Hebron today in Arabic is called Al-Halil. Al-Halil, because it's Abraham's city. It's the city of the friend, the friend of God. And then we get the friend really is the first Muslim. So by being a friend, you are a Muslim, as Abraham will will show us, as Muhammad will show us in the Quran. And in the letter of James, by being a friend of God, Abraham shows that that's how you're saved. Works and faith working together, not Paul's way. It is not faith in Jesus Christ alone that saves you. It is works, good works, that save you along with faith. And, and, and this is an argument goes all the way up to Luther's time. Luther didn't like the letter of James, wanted to throw it out of the New Testament, said it's not a Christian letter, and it, and it isn't. And uh, all the people in Christianity who say, want to say, oh, I got faith in Christ, I'm saved. Well, that's not what the Palestinian doctrine was. That's the Pauline doctrine. And they say, well, what did Jesus say? Well, I don't think Jesus went around saying, have faith in me and you'll be saved. I doubt if anyone ever said that. He wouldn't have had a big following. People don't like to hear that. 
Oh, believe in me and you'll be saved. Even if, suppose I said that to you. Hey, I'm Professor Eisman. Believe in me and you'll be saved. You'll, you start throwing stones at me. You run out of the room. People don't like that. Another person has to say that later. Oh, you know that guy who lived back then? Believe on him and you'll be saved. So a third person has to say it. And that's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. He did it and saved it like that. But the James people opposed it. In any case, the key person is Abraham. That's uh, enough on that subject. Let's now go 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 on now to the uh, to the Arab tribes. We know a little about about the Arab background now. I drew you this map here. This will take some time. I'm not in a rush in this course. The slower we go, the better. The slower we go, what's your work you should be doing? Don't do anything. Just relax. No, no, don't, don't work hard. Don't kill yourself. I don't need to kill yourself. <laughs> Uh, try to keep up with me wherever I am uh, in this book here. Uh, the only thing we're reading in this thing are the passages uh, Saba and Himyar and the War of Basus and the, and the Ethiopian in Invasion. We're reading chapters 1 and 2. I guess this goes up uh, to about page 69. So this is uh, the first. That's all we're reading in this book here. Up to so. Read it when you get some time. You don't want to read it. I'm going to go through it too, but it's always good if you read it first. It gives you a double. So here's the Arabian Peninsula. We already talked about the monsoons. We already talked about the uh, about the uh, trading and this kind of thing. So originally, <coughs> there were groups of people down here. This was called Saba. And another name later on for it was called Himyar. That's all will be in the book you have. This is Southern Arabia. The reason it's important is this is where the monsoon rains came and gave the sort of uh, uh, fertility that was required. This is the Red Sea here. And uh, even in the Bible, there are stories about Southern Arabia. Forget the Northern Arabia, which is up here. The place Job is inhabiting is north of uh, Mecca and Medina, an oasis called Taima, which still exists to the present day. So you want to get here, this will be Medina here. Uh, but Medina wasn't called Medina back then, it was called al Yafrid. It only became Medina after the prophet fled to it and the people began to talk about it. And then down here is Mecca. Okay? And Arabia, this, uh, where all the wealth is now is over here and he's it sort of uh, drifts over in a kind of uh, flat, plateauish sort of uh, fall off, but there are mountains all along here, right here, okay? So, this is more like the desert area over here. Um, in this southern area, those of you who know the Bible, is this referred to in the Bible stories? Who comes from there? Saba? in the Bible becomes, or is, Shiva. You've got to just watch continents. Don't worry too much about the H's and the E's and the A's and so on. Who comes from Shiva? The Queen of Shiva. And who has relations according to the Bible with the Queen of Shiva? Solomon. You, you've got to read your Bible more carefully. You're a good Bible person, but you're, you're not reading it uh, with the with the comprehension and the re retaining that you've got to get these things precise. You will now, because I'm going to make you do it, and you're going to feel embarrassed that you don't have this right down the way you should with the precision. Because you've got more knowledge on the other folks on these subjects, but you're not getting the precision that you want to have. Anyway, not Abraham, Solomon. Solomon marries the Queen of Sheba, and that's around the 10th century BC. Or marries many wives, important. And he's David's son, he's king in um, Jerusalem. But what happens in that marriage with Solomon? Or that encounter with Solomon. She's supposed to have one of his children go back to, we think of it as Ethiopia, but it isn't. It's southern Arabia. It's later that Ethiopia is over here, and the southern Arabians colonized the Ethiopians. And you get really uh, southern Arabian sort of colonies. Here's Somalia, and then up here is uh, Eritrea, and uh, here's Ethiopia inland here. And so a lot of activity that is not in the light of written history took place in this moving back and forth between these areas across the Red Sea here. And so the Ethiopians say, our kings are descendant of who? Solomon and Sheba. 
And so those legends then came through from here and went all the way over to here, and they say, uh, 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 the Queen of Sheba is an Ethiopian queen. Oh, but she wasn't, really. She was a Southern Arabian queen. And what happened was, as a result of this encounter, real or otherwise, with Sheba, the waterways here were open to Jewish Hebrew shipping. And they built a port, it's in the Bible, they built a port here at the top of the, uh, of the Red Sea, where present-day Aqaba and Adah are. And uh, that was the trade down the Red Sea with the Queen of Sheba's people at the bottom. And what did they want from the bottom? Frankincense. Frankincense and all those things. But also, this was a trade route from India. The coastal sort of boats came over across the Indian Ocean, and they brought silks and spices. So there was lots of stuff that came into southern Arabia, not just mirror and frankincense, but silks and spices from the India trade. And then those things were brought up on caravans. North. Sometimes they were brought up on the Red Sea. But the Red Sea was difficult navigation, first of all, and second of all, there was a lot of piracy. So it could only be held open when you had a strong government that could control the piracy. When you didn't have a strong government that could control the piracy, the easier way was to come up through the overland route, through the caravan route, and that went through Mecca and so on up to, actually it went up to the city called Petra in Transjordan, where I told you Herod's father came from. But in any case, where Herod's mother came from. Does that, why did it go to Petra? Why was Petra so important as a collecting area? How many have been to Petra? I've been there. It's in this sort of uh, canyon. If you don't enter through this huge, you know, how many saw Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? But I was all filmed in Petra. You can only go through this long, the, the river has cut this, uh, this, this long sort of Grand Canyon between two sort of steep sides, and then when you get inside, it opens up into a kind of staging area with water and everything. And that's where the city was, so all the caravans could go in there and be protected from marauders. And the people of Petra would take a toll for the, having, you know, uh, given sanctuary and hospitality to the caravans, and they got rich there. And then they carved these uh, cities out of the stone there. So it became very, very a flourishing area between around the 3rd century BC to about the 3rd uh, or 4th century AD. It was a very uh, important commercial center and extremely rich and so on. And that was the end of the caravan trade. That Muhammad was probably a participant. He probably went to Petra at some point if the stories are correct. In any case, Saba, which is in Southern Arabia used to be called, is really also what the Jews are calling Sheba. And if you look at the people, I don't like to be racialistic, the physical characteristic, they're very small boned, uh, uh, not very tall, wiry. You can always see uh, someone from Southern Arabia. There are Jews who come from there too. Uh, now it's called Yemen. And you go to Palestine, you'll see Yemenite Jews and they're all look very much the same like the people from Southern Arabia. And also the people in Somalia and Eritrea, uh, of course there's intermixing with African as well, but even though the uh, coloring may be somewhat lighter or darker or whatever, the basic bone and the same, and all those uh, peoples are, are clearly related in their uh, at least physical characteristics. So you can always recognize people from Southern Arabia, Somalia, and these, uh, and these places, they look very much alike. For instance, they don't look like West Africans at all. Uh, they just look different. And uh, they have their own uh, characteristics. I don't know who I can. Uh, you know who looks very much like that, that movie maker? What's his name? Um, the gun movies uh, about Malcolm X and. Uh, Spike Lee. Sp Spike? Lee. Yeah, he looks very much like that. Uh, and James Baldwin, to a certain extent. People, you know, that very small, wiry, sort of um, very thin uh, look, uh, very much uh, East African, Somali.